Hi there, my name is Alex and I'm the Director of Education with the Canadian Institute of Home Inspectors. I want to thank you for joining us today. We're going to be doing an inspection on a 1962 home built in Calgary, Alberta. Before we start our inspection process training video, I'd like to bring up two key points. Firstly, home inspections are not code compliance inspections. While some inspectors may be well versed in a multitude of codes and standards, they are not required to know these by provincial regulations. Secondly, while we are demonstrating our recommended inspection process, feel free to use what suits you best and augment those that don't. So let's get started. When beginning your exterior inspection, you'll want to inspect from multiple distances from the structure. This will allow you to gain different perspectives mitigating the probability of you missing defects. We recommend to begin on one isolated corner of the structure, such as a side without gate access. Complete an entire loop going one way around the structure and then retrace your steps going the other way. This will help you spot deficiencies that may be missed from certain viewpoints. Also, if the structure has multiple complex features, you may want to perform a third walk around to ensure you don't miss anything. It is very common to find vegetation at the exterior walls of homes. We recommend that these be removed from the cladding at least 30 centimeters or one foot to mitigate vermin intrusion, moisture damage, and mechanical damage to the structure. Exterior receptacles below 2.5 meters should be tested for ground fault protection. These safety devices have been required since the early 1970s electrical code, and it is good practice to inform the potential home buyers the location of master or main resets. You want to test the functionality of the GFI protection as well as inspecting the general condition of the housing. All dwellings should have exterior luminaires at entrances, but some older homes may not have them. If missing, it is recommended they be installed for safety. You want to inspect the housing and seals, check for protective covers, if the bulbs are rated for exterior use, any damage as well as any critters, debris or vegetation inside which may increase the probability of overheating. Landings, entrances and decks follow similar inspection processes. You want to confirm that the construction follows local having jurisdictional requirements and this includes inspecting the handrails, stairs and any structural components that are exposed. You should inspect other exterior finishes such as cladding, windows, doors, receptacles and luminaires if present. Now it is common that landings may have building materials that prevent the inspection of the structural components below. If this is the case, you'll want to disclose this limitation in your inspection report. During your home inspection, you may come across vermin infestation or nests. Naturally, if you come across these items, you want to point them out in your inspection report so that the potential buyer and the current owners actually know of this situation. When inspecting driveways and walkways, you want to check their condition for cracks, spalling, trip hazards, settlement, levelness and slope towards buildings. If there's a fence line on the property, we recommend that you inspect the system. However, it should be noted that some home inspection standards or practice do not require you to do so. You'll want to walk the perimeter of the fence line, pushing on the support posts and panels while you're probing for rot and noting other deficiencies such as damage, heavy vegetation, leaning and defective or missing hardware. Any gates that are locked or inoperable should be indicated in your inspection report as a limitation with a photo. As you're performing your exterior inspection, you'll want to confirm the foundation material. Is it cast in place concrete, concrete blocks, ICF, PWF, or piers? If you cannot determine the foundation material during your exterior inspection, be sure to do so when you enter the home. If you still cannot determine the foundation material, you'll want to know this in the inspection report as a limitation. Decks are a personal favorite because this is where you can really flex your carpentry knowledge. These structures generally have the most defects because some unskilled homeowners may watch a reality TV show and then decide to become weekend warriors building decks. Some items to inspect are stair construction including riser height and tread length, handrail designs, stringers, joist beam and support post selection, faster selection, ledger boards, footings and drip edge flashing if required. Be sure to probe for rod in random areas, specifically horizontal planes, as well as checking the integrity of support posts and handrails.
When you've completed inspecting the structural components below the deck, you'll want to continue the inspection on top. Be sure to continue checking the construction and installation of handrails, the decking, cladding, windows, luminaires, receptacles, and gas lines if present. If the home you're inspecting has overhead service, you want to confirm that the service conductors are not within reach from a deck, window, door, walkway, driveway, and even roof lines. One of the most common defects noted by home inspectors is log grading. The ideal grading slopes away from the structure to reduce the chance of water intrusion inside. However, it is common to find flat grading due to settlement over time. If you notice the grading is flat or sloping towards the structure, you want to indicate this in your inspection report as well as being extra vigilant when you inspect the basement or crawl space in these areas. Another note regarding grading is that you should look at the neighboring properties to confirm that they're not draining their surface water towards the building you're inspecting as this can also lead to water intrusion. Speaking of water intrusion, one of the most common ways water enters into structures is due to issues with the downspouts, also known as leaders. First, confirm that a roof drainage system, which includes the gutters and downspouts, is actually installed. Check that they are attached properly, not damaged, and extend a minimum of 6 feet or 1.5 meters away from the structure if possible. If you come across downspouts that terminate below grade, you want to include a clause in your inspection report stating they are not inspected unless, of course, the potential buyer has requested this as an add-on service. These systems can be problematic for a variety of reasons, including blockages and collapse. There are many types of cladding or siding that are used in construction to provide the first plane of protection. Some of the most common types in Canada are vinyl, stucco, hardboard, brick and stone, lumber siding, wood shakes and shingles, eaves, and metal. You want to be looking out for gaps, damage, vermin infestation, incorrect installation, missing sections, as well as improper installation of flashing details. We recommend that you move manageable items such as barbecues and garbage cans away from structures to check for damage behind them as they may obstruct your view. If you cannot move an item such as a pile of wood or bricks, include this limitation in your report with at least one photo. Another note regarding cladding is that you want to confirm that any siding that is adversely affected by moisture is installed adequately above the grating to prevent freeze-thaw cycles and water absorption damage. Be mindful though that these clearances vary depending on the materials installed. Lastly, any wood siding should be pro for rot as a thick coat of paint can mask this. Vent termination points should be inspected for multiple items such as adequate air movement and proper airflow direction. You want to confirm there are flaps installed which are operating correctly and that there is no debris preventing a seal between the exterior elements and inside the structure. We recommend that during your inspection you actuate all exhaust fans including bathroom fans, kitchen, whole house fans, HRVs and ERVs as well as any dryers. Make a mental note as to the number of fans that are exhausting and confirm that all termination points are accounted for. When testing and inspecting hose bibs, look out for leaks of the valve handle and vacuum breaker assembly. If there is no vacuum breaker assembly, recommend that the potential buyer install one for safety. It is also good practice that the hose bib slopes away from the structure to allow for drainage. Sometimes the supply may be shut and you will want to confirm with the owners if the supply can be turned on to test the hose bib. If the stem conduction is hidden behind the drywall or insulation, you will want to indicate this in your report as you may not be able to detect for leaks. Chances are you'll only operate the hose bib for a few seconds versus a homeowner that waters their lawn. If the home you're inspecting uses natural gas, be sure to inspect the gas meter. This includes checking for excessive corrosion, securement of the unit and piping, and the distance of the regulator vent to openings, electrical meter bases, and mechanical intakes into the structure. Window wells provide an ingress and egress route in cases of emergencies. While the current building code does not specifically describe window well requirements, it is generally assumed that a window within 180 millimeters of grade or 6 inches have a well installed to prevent water intrusion inside and water damage to the wood components. 
Sometimes you will notice that a window wall cover is installed, which are great, but just be aware that these should not be installed for windows that access bedrooms. Windows can be a high cost item to replace, so you want to spend extra time on them. Begin by noting any damage, failed window seals on multi-glaze units, incorrect installation and orientation, missing or defective flashing details, clogged weep holes, deteriorated or missing caulking, and probing for rot if they're made of wood. When performing the roofing inspection, be aware of what is required by the standards or practice you follow. Most standards or practice do not require you to walk on a roof and there are alternatives such as binoculars, telescopic poles, setting ladders at the eaves and using drones. Setting up ladders should be done so in a safe manner and we recommend you research various ladder types before buying one to determine which performs this task safely and efficiently for you. As you make your way up to the roof line, check to see if drippage flashing has been installed along with underlayment. Keep in mind that while drip pitch flashing is not required on roof lines by the current building code, there are many advantages when it is installed. Also, there are circumstances when underlayment is not required, so be aware of this. Once you're on the roof, we will begin inspecting multiple items such as the roof covering materials, termination points, flashing details, vulnerable areas, and ventilation. If you note any vulnerable areas during your roofing inspection, be vigilant and check for signs of water damage in these spots once you're in the attic space and upper floor. Surface water management begins with the gutters and again you want to make sure that they are installed. You want to confirm there are no leaks, debris, damage and that there is proper slope and securement for the system. Oftentimes, the building science components on the roof are neglected during home inspections. Again, you want to confirm that all fans are venting adequately such as bathrooms, range and dryer vents. Also, depending on your jurisdiction, screens may not be allowed on certain vent termination points such as dryers. If the roof requires ventilation, you do not need to perform any insulated drywall ceiling calculations. However, it is good practice to make a mental count of the number of roof vents and then make a professional judgment if it is adequate. We recommend that you check in random spots on the roof line for drip edge flashing as it may be installed on the lower roof line but not the upper or missing in various sections. In addition, we recommend you inspect shingles in random areas by gently lifting them up to check for securement. Be careful, however, to not break the adhesion seal between the layers. Some roof lines that you inspect may have vulnerable areas. These include varying slopes, 
for designs such as dead valleys and projections into valleys, as well as changing in the roof covering materials or even butterfly roofs. Again, you want to indicate the vulnerable areas in your inspection report, as well as being extra vigilant to check for water intrusion into the structure in these areas. When inspecting HVAC termination points, you want to confirm that proper orientation, slope, securement, distance requirements such as ground clearance, anticipated snow loads, proximities to corners, building openings, mechanical and non-mechanical air intakes, decks, regulator vents, as well as flashing and ceiling details have been employed. One thing to note is that older homes often lack makeup air and combustion air intakes. However, these systems may or may not be required depending on the HVAC system inside. All other termination points should be inspected for proper securement, sizing, flashing, and caulking details when required. If the roof line has valleys, these can be problematic, so you want to spend extra time here, especially when they're not maintained or installed correctly. You want to note any debris, damage, and incorrect installation practices such as fasteners down the center line or improper overlaps between the valley and roof covering materials. Again, if you see poor workmanship in the valleys or anywhere on the roof line, spend extra time in the attic space looking out for signs of water damage and water intrusion in these areas. If the home you're inspecting has a detached garage, the exterior inspection process is similar to the dwelling. This includes performing two laps around the structure, checking the exterior walls and grating, as well as the roofing assembly. The interior inspection process of the garage is similar to the dwelling as well. We'll discuss this process in further detail shortly, but in a quick summary, after turning on all the lights, the fans, and heating equipment, you want to begin taking photos of the interior space, which will document any limitations such as stored items and vehicles to include in your inspection report. Now that we've completed the exterior portion of the garage, we're going to move inside. We recommend that you begin inspecting the ceiling above the vehicle door for any watermarks, damage, organic growth, and incomplete billing envelope. Once this area is inspected, open the vehicle door to allow more daylight into the garage to assist with the inspection. 
continue inspecting the remaining areas of the ceiling before moving on to windows, receptacles, and man doors. Now you can begin inspecting the vehicle door. It is very common to find damage to the door or panels. If the door is made of wood, probe for rot, especially in the corners of the frame. Likewise, corrosion should be reported to further investigate as to why it is occurring. When you're ready for the vehicle door, there's a few components you want to be inspecting such as the rollers, the tracks, the hinges, pulleys, springs and safety sensors. We don't recommend using any objects besides your hand or foot to test the safety sensors as you can cause damage should the sensors fail or be inoperative. Also, we don't recommend you test the trolley disconnect but you may want to inform your clients of its purpose. Prior to beginning the interior inspection, there are several processes we recommend you employ. First off, walk through the entire home and turn on all the lights and open all the interior doors. This will give you a general layout and feel for the home. The last process we recommend you incorporate after entering the home but before beginning your interior inspection is to document the floors. Using a camera, record all the rooms and areas on every floor. These images or videos can be used as limitations in your inspection report if there are stored items such as boxes or furniture obstructing your view as well as assisting your clients if damages occur or appliances are swapped after the condition removal date.
Next, depending on the standards of practice you follow, you may or may not be required to inspect and test appliances such as dishwashers and laundry facilities. Should you decide to include these into your inspection, we recommend starting with the washer, the dryer, and dishwasher once you enter the home to allow enough time for complete cycles. We don't recommend you engage these appliances when you're not inside the home. We will discuss basic inspection processes for these shortly. When inspecting the dishwasher, you want to be vigilant for watermarks around the unit as this may indicate an ongoing or past concern. If you notice swelling of the flooring, this is another note for further investigation. When you first open the door, gently push down on it to confirm the appliance is secured. Next, look around the door seal and note any damage, deterioration or debris accumulation. Then, pull out each rack individually, confirming smooth operation and the stops are in place. After the cycle is complete, if possible, remove the kick plate below the unit and check for any active leaks or other notes of concern. When inspecting the washing machine, inspect the door and door seals for damage and integrity. Noting any faded labels on the control manifold into your inspection report is also a good practice. You want to look behind the laundry facilities for any corrosion and leaks at the water lines, check for disconnected or damaged vent lines, note any debris or lint accumulation, as well as check and blow the washing machine after the cycle has completed for leaks. Now we're ready to begin our inspection of the main heating appliance inside the home. Most commonly, this may be a furnace, boiler or electric radiant heating. In this home, we have a furnace. We start with a general inspection. First, we remove all the cabinet doors. Record the data plate, check inside for debris, scorching, loose components, watermarks, corrosion and any active leaks. You can inspect the plenum for signs of water damage and debris and that the air filter for cleanliness, for proper sizing and orientation. After the initial inspection of the furnace, we want to engage the heating appliance and confirm its operation. We recommend increasing the temperature by 5 degrees, watching the firing sequence, and then using our gas detection devices to catch any leaks. The reason why we recommend the temperature being increased by 5 degrees is because it typically takes between 20 and 40 minutes to reach the set point, giving more time to detect any deficiencies within the appliance. As you continue your inspection in the mechanical room, while the furnace is operating, we want to be listening for any abnormal noises such as loud venture motors or if the unit is misfiring. Now we can begin a more in-depth inspection of the furnace and its components. This includes that AC90 armored cable is installed for the circuit branch wiring if required, and if an electrical disconnect switch, if also required, is labeled. That metal gas piping is bonded, has a shutoff valve along with a sediment trap, and there is a union installed at the gas valve for servicing. As I mentioned earlier, some older homes may not have makeup air or combustion air intakes. This is the case in this home where we have naturally vented gas-fired appliances. If you come across a similar situation, you may want to inform the potential buyers of the implications of not having dedicated fresh air intakes. After confirming there are no gas leaks, we want to verify the heating supply units such as the ducts and radiators are producing heat. Using a thermal imaging camera, temperature gun or even your hand, go to each heating unit and confirm that it is operational. Oftentimes, you will find disconnected ducts or ducts that are covered by flooring and drywall. Naturally, you should include these deficiencies into your inspection report. The last item we inspect with four-star heating systems are the plenums. You'll want to indicate any significant openings around the furnace as these not only lead to efficiency loss, but can also cause condensation to form if an air conditioner is installed. The best location to inspect for cleanliness of return air ducts are in the living room or master bedroom as generally we spend most of our time here. One thing to note is housekeeping. It is very common for homeowners to store items that should not be in the mechanical room including paints, bar saws, jerry cans, vehicle batteries, and kitty litter boxes. If you see these items, you should recommend they be removed to avoid damaging the appliances in the mechanical room and maintaining higher levels of air quality inside the house.
After completing the HVAC portion of the inspection, we move on to the plumbing components. We begin with the water heater and capture the data plate. The data plate will tell you information such as the capacity, age, BT rating, fuel source, and other items which you can include in your report. We recommend indicating where the thermostat is so that potential buyers can adjust the heat to prevent scalding or set a typification mode when required. Now we can begin the inspection process for the water heater starting at the burner compartment confirming that all safety devices are integral including the sight glass and combustible vapor sensor if equipped. Look at the general cleanliness inside the compartment documenting any watermarks and corrosion at the connection points and anywhere on the body of the tank. You want to confirm that the TPR valve is not weeping and has a drain tube installed correctly as well as checking for an isolation valve on the cold supply into the appliance. Some jurisdictions may require seismic straps, so be sure to check with your local having jurisdiction for these specifications. After completing the water heater inspection, you will want to capture the location of the main water shutoff as well as the type of supply and drain plumbing lines in the home. One of the things to note is that older homes built before the 60s may not have floor drains. If this is the case, you will want to point this out to your clients as it can increase the chance of flooding. The final major system that we inspect is the panel board. Most standard practices do not require that you remove the dead front. If you choose to remove the cover, you want to confirm that it is not energized using a Voltec. Wearing proper personal protective equipment, which may include a full face shield, electrician's gloves, and appropriate footwear is recommended. Before removing the dead front, confirm that the service access and installation location are suitable. After removing the cover, you can now inspect for debris, signs of water damage, and incorrect installation practices. You will want to note the main disconnect rating size as well as the circuit branch wiring, whether it is copper or aluminum. Should you choose to test any overcurrent protection devices such as AFCI and JFCI breakers, you may want to leave a note for the sellers informing them that you have done so in case they need to reset clocks, entertainment systems, or medical devices. One last recommendation is to take photos before and after removing the dead front to record the breaker switches before and after your inspection. After completing the inspection in the mechanical room, we begin the general inspection of the basement starting in the bathroom. We recommend the following inspection process. Start by testing and inspecting the door and hardware to the room, then check the ceiling using a high powered flashlight with at least 1000 lumens for any watermarks or damage. This is followed by testing any windows and their hardware as well as inspecting for any signs of failed seals and water ingress. Next, you want to test the receptacles. Modern homes should have GFI protected receptacles in many locations such as bathrooms, kitchens, and outside in most circumstances. You want to test these safety devices using an outlet analyzer that has GFI testing capabilities or using the test function of the receptacle or overcurrent protection device. After completing the general room inspection, we will now start inspecting and testing the fixtures. Before running any water, we want to look for any corrosion and surface defects in the sinks, toilets, and bath or shower units. If there is tile, gently push on them to confirm they are fully adhered to the wall and there is no movement. Now we can begin running the water starting by running the hot first, then switching to the cold and ending in the middle. This is the same process for the basin and bathing fixtures. We recommend running the water for 10 minutes per fixture. For the water closet, you want to confirm that the hardware is installed and in good condition, check for any movement, and making sure that the seats and the lids don't have any damage. You also want to make sure that the supply to the water closet has a shutoff. For the water closet, you want to first confirm that the hardware is installed and in good condition. Check for securement to the anchor bolts, confirm that a shutoff valve is installed for the water supply, and we recommend running the unit for 10 minutes as well. Once you have the water running, you want to check for leaks within the first 30 seconds and every 2-3 to three minutes to make sure things are flowing where they should be for all the fixtures. During this time, take a look underneath the sink and behind the bathing unit if permissible to spot any leaks, water damage, proper trap installation, slope and venting of the drain waste and venting system, as well as recommending any shutoff valves if not present. After inspecting the major systems in the home, along with the bathrooms and plumbing fixtures in the basement, we are now going to begin our general interior inspection, starting in the lowest level of the dwelling. The process is similar to how we inspected the basement bathroom, which begins with testing the doors and their hardware, followed by checking ceilings for water marks and damage, functioning windows and their hardware, including blinds, looking for signs of any water damage around the windows, and making sure screens are installed and in good condition. Lastly, we're going to test the receptacles using an outlet analyzer.
While you're conducting your interior inspection, you want to be looking out for safety devices such as smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. You want to confirm that these safety devices are not expired and they typically have a shelf life of 7 to 10 years depending on the manufacturer. The last item we're going to inspect in the basement is for water intrusion at the exterior perimeter walls. The easiest way to do this is by using a high powered flashlight to check the baseboards for any water damage and water marks. You can also use a scratch awl to check behind the baseboards so long as you don't break any caulking or paint seals or cause damage to the building materials. An alternative method is by lifting the carpet and looking at the carpet tack strips for any signs of water damage or organic growth. However, this should only be attempted without damaging any building materials. After completing the basement inspection, we will perform the same inspection process on the main floor and upper floors. This begins by running plumbing fixtures and inspecting the bathrooms first. Then we inspect the rooms and closets starting with the doors, ceilings, windows, receptacles and finishing in the kitchen last. After completing our recommended inspection process in the kitchen, we recommend you inspect the cabinets and counters as well as the remaining appliances. Open the cabinet doors and test any movable racks or shelves and confirm that all countertops are secured. When inspecting the exterior doors, there are a few items you want to be looking out for. First off, you want to confirm there is smooth operation of the door. You want to make sure that all the hardware is in place and operating correctly including knobs, deadbolts, weather stripping, fastener for the hinges and the doorbell as well. Also, if there are any rugs or carpets at the entrance, pull them away to check for any sort of damage. After completing the general inspection of the remaining floors, we're going to make our way into the attic space, starting with a few housekeeping items. First off, you want to use a tarp or drop cloth to catch any insulation that may fall from the attic onto the floor. Secondly, you want to wash your hands to prevent leaving any fingerprints on the hatch. As you enter the attic, look for weather stripping and insulation at the hatch as it is often missing or deteriorating. Once inside the attic, we're going to begin the building science portion of the inspection before moving on to the structural components. We're going to begin inspecting the roof and soffit ventilation if present. We're going to inspect the insulation type and depth, as well as confirming the integrity of the air barrier around suspect areas such as vent stacks, chimneys, light fixtures, electrical conduits, and partition walls. One tip for inspecting soffit ventilation is by turning off your flashlight and looking into the soffits for daylight. Depending on your jurisdiction, Homes in your area may be susceptible to attic crane, so be on the lookout for this as well. After completing the building science portion of the attic, we're going to perform the structural inspection. In most homes, the attic space and mechanic room likely will be the only two areas where the structural components are revealed. We want to be looking out for damaged building components, such as roof decking and ultra trusses, damaged rafters and water damage, and you may come across failing fasteners from time to time as well. Naturally, all these items should be documented in your inspection report. After the attic inspection, the last item we're going to perform is the thermal imaging scan. We're going to start in the mechanical room where we began our interior inspection and retrace our path back upstairs where we ended at the attic hatch. One thing to keep in mind is to switch between looking at the display of your thermal imaging camera while still being mindful of your surroundings so you don't get tunnel vision.
Before leaving the home, we recommend that you complete one final walkthrough to make sure that you have reset the home. This includes shutting off all the lights, closing all the doors and windows, making sure that all personal belongings are placed back to where they were before you arrived, and confirming that all exterior doors are locked. You may need to reference your general photos or videos of each floor to confirm the location of the items that you may have moved during your inspection. Thank you again for joining us today on this brief inspection process video. I want to remind you again that while we recommend you become well versed in your local jurisdictional codes, as a home inspector you are not required to know them. However, you will want to be aware of the inspection requirements of the standards of practice you follow. If you have any suggestions or feedback for this video, we'd love to hear from you and you can send us an email through our contact form on our website at homeinspectortraining.ca. See you in the next video.